It's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Jack Graham today, who's going to be giving the Bruno Klopfer Award. Dr. Graham received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of North Carolina in 1965 under the mentorship of distinguished MMPI scholars Grant Dahlstrom and George Welsh. After a brief stint at Lake Forest College in Illinois, he joined the faculty at Kent State University in 1968. He was promoted to full professor in the Department of Psychology in 1977 and stayed in this capacity until his, re his retirement in 2009. He was also department chair between 1992 and 2000. Dr. Graham is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, a fellow of the Society for Personality Assessment, and a fellow of the American Board of Assessment Psychology. He's been a member of Section 9 since his incorporation. Dr. Graham has been the associate editor for psychological assessment and has been a consulting editor for numerous journals on assessment psychology and forensic psychology, including Section 9's assessment. Dr. Graham has been a prolific contributor to the field of psychological assessment in general and the MMPI in particular over the past four decades. He's authored or co-authored over 100 scholarly publications, including 11 books. He's co-author of the MMPI-2 and MMPI-A test manuals. Dr. Graham is also the author of MMPI-2, Assessing Personality and Psychopathology, currently in its fourth edition and the most widely used interpretive textbook for the MMPI uh, in print. Um, and uh, I have on my bookshelf the first edition, the second edition, the third edition, and the fourth edition of Dr. Graham's book. book. So it is a great pleasure, a personal pleasure, uh, for me to be able to introduce Dr. Graham and award him the Klopfer Award. Dr. Graham. Thank you very much. I don't know if this mic is working. Can, can you hear me if I'm talking on this mic? Okay. Good. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the board of SBA for selecting me to receive the Klopfer Award. Uh, it was very humbling when I looked at the list of people who had received this award in the past and saw names like Paul Meal. Lee J. Kronbach, uh, John Exner, Irv Weiner, uh, Aka Telegan, and of course many others as well. Sometimes in situations like that, my imposter syndrome comes into play. And I, I guess I thought maybe I fooled him once again. But at any rate, I'm very grateful uh, for, for the award. In thinking about, well, first of all, when I was asked to uh, talk at this meeting, uh, it was suggested that I focus on my career, and particularly uh, people who have influenced me, uh, people I have worked with, and uh, to some extent, the work we have done. As you see on, oh, you don't see. Okay, we need the slides. Okay. As you see on the slide, I'm going to talk about my assessment journey and more than 50 years of research. I started my work with the MMPI as a first year graduate student at UNC uh, for a master's thesis. Uh, so I've been at this for a very long time, but I'll get to that again in a minute. My assessment career really started in my junior year in college at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. I started out as an economics major at DePaul and very quickly, maybe not quickly enough, but I decided it really wasn't for me. Uh, economics as it was taught there was far too conceptual and theoretical for me. 
and I was, I, I think, much more interested in, in something more applied. In my junior year at DePaul, I enrolled in an abnormal psychology course taught by this guy, John Exner. Um, John gave me a C in the course. Uh, by the way, the only C I ever got in a psychology course. But in spite of having received that C after the course was over, John asked me if I would like to be his research assistant. And of course, I was very flattered and, and readily agreed to do so. John was the director of the Bureau of Testing and Research at DePaul. And my job involved very mundane tasks like uh, scoring uh, test sheets, filing things uh, in, in, in a number of uh, paper files. But when we weren't so busy at the Bureau, uh, John would talk with me about the Rorschach. And he would talk about some cases, and he would show me some protocols. And I was absolutely fascinated by the kinds of things that John would infer about people based on their responses to what at that time seemed very strange looking ink plots to me. I decided pretty much then and there that I was going to be a Rorschach researcher. And when I got ready to apply to graduate schools, John helped me find several where Rorschach research was taking place. I was admitted to two, uh, the University of Connecticut and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I chose Chapel Hill, and we have a, that's what it's like in Chapel Hill right now, probably. No, it really isn't. They've, they've had 10 inches of snow in, in North Carolina today. But at any rate, I chose Chapel Hill because of some work that a person named Earl Bauman, and I don't know how familiar that name is uh, for you, was doing some research involving uh, altering the structure of the ink plots and seeing what effects that had on the kinds of responses that people would give. And that sounded very interesting to me. So I uh, chose North Carolina. I showed up on a very hot, humid August day. And very soon after arriving, I made an appointment with Dr. Bauman and went in and announced to him that I was a new student and I was very much interested in working with him on his Rorschach research. I remember to this very moment exactly how he responded. I don't do Rorschach research anymore. So what was I to do? Uh, there was nobody else at Carolina uh, doing Rorschach research. Uh, I heard that Hans Strupp, who was at the hospital, was interested in a research assistant. So I went and talked with him, and he offered me an assistantship uh, working on his psychotherapy research. But that really wasn't of much interest to me. I was still interested in assessment. I also heard from other graduate students that George Welsh and Grant Dahlstrom uh, were experts on the MMPI. So I approached George Welsh, and I don't know how I chose Welsh over Dahlstrom. Uh, that does not come back to me. But I went to see Welsh and asked him if he would be my thesis advisor, and he said yes, he would. It wasn't long after I started working with George that it became apparent that he really wasn't interested in the MMPI. So now I've been told somebody not doing Rorschach. Now I find a guy who's really not interested in the MMPI, even though he's my advisor on an MMPI study. But at any rate, with little help from George, I was able to conceptualize and execute a very modest MMPI study for my master's thesis, which, by the way, was, was never published, thank goodness. Uh, at Carolina, at the time, the typical procedure was for clinical students to go off campus and do a year-long internship doing their third year of graduate school and then return to campus in the fourth year to complete a dissertation. So that's really what I had in mind, but about the time that I was thinking about internship, uh, Dahlstrom, uh, uh, who had agreed to be my dissertation advisor, came to me, and I think I have a not very great picture of Grant, but uh, 
uh, came to me and said, would I like to be a test case for a new program that the department was considering? I would spend two years on internship instead of one, but during that two-year period, I not only would get the clinical experience associated with internship, but I would be given time and resources to complete a dissertation at the hospital. And I thought that sounded like a pretty good deal, so I agreed to do that and uh, then moved from UNC Chapel Hill to the Salem uh, VA Hospital. Although Dahlstrom was my official uh, advisor of record, uh, he really wasn't the most influential person in my research training. Uh, that person was a guy named Bill Eichmann, which probably is not a familiar name to most of you. Uh, Bill had done some factor analyses of the MMPI by hand back in those days. Uh, and so he was interested in what I was doing. I, I did not do factor analysis by hand, by the way. So uh, Eichmann was my day-to-day -day, uh, uh, or supervisor of my dissertation, was very helpful. And the program worked, at least for me, in that by the end of two years, I had completed an approved internship and I had defended my dissertation and was on my way. After a brief stint at Lake Forest College, as mentioned earlier, where I taught undergraduates and did some student counseling, uh, I decided that that setting really wasn't for me and that I wanted to be in a place where I would have more time for research and where I could mentor graduate students. So in 1968, I took a job as an assistant professor at Kent State University uh, in Ohio and have been employed there ever since. Uh, I retired from psychology in 2009. I finished up six graduate students who were in the pipeline and thought then I would be retiring. I guess I wasn't really ready for retirement because when asked if I would become the interim dean of the College of Technology, of all things, I agreed to do that while they searched for a permanent dean. Of course, I knew nothing about technology, but I survived. I then took on some several other positions in the College of Public Health, and right now I'm the Associate Dean of the College of Public Health at Kent, a position which I will be ending at the end of June when my wife Mary Ann and I are both finally going to retire uh, from the university. So that is uh, the, the assessment story to date. Now, a couple important things happened uh, while I was at Kent that had a large influence on my career and the uh, kinds of research that I would be doing for the next X number of years. Jim Butcher, who I think many of you know, was a classmate of mine at UNC a year ahead of me, and he had taken a job, a faculty job, at the University of Minnesota. He called me one day and asked if I would get involved in a program that he had started, which would be a symposium, a research symposium about the MMPI and also a, uh, some workshops because he found out that even in Minnesota, people didn't really know all that much about the MMPI. So uh, Jim and I worked together uh, on the uh, symposium workshop for, for many years. And when uh, Jim decided that he no longer wanted to have a leadership position, uh, several of us uh, took over the uh, leadership roles. Joseph Ben Porath and I assumed the uh, coordination of the workshops and symposia. Uh, and we had support, uh, very good support, from the University of Minnesota Press and the test publisher, who at that time was National Computer Systems, and of course now is uh, Pearson Assessments. These are the characters that carried on the symposium and workshop after Jim stopped. Uh, I think you know probably most of these. This is Josie in the upper left, Paul uh, with a drink in his hand in the upper right, Aka Telligan at the left, and then of course uh, I'm at the bottom right. Uh, we also had help from others, uh, but we were the regular staff 
of the uh, program. But we had help from other people uh, eventually, like Dustin Wigand, Martin Selbaum, uh, John McNulty, and, uh, and others would come in and do a piece of the program uh, at the annual meeting. I'm happy to say that the uh, workshop and symposium program has continued uh, to date, and we are set to celebrate our 50th meeting uh, in Minnesota the first week in, in June. So that's uh, a, a lot about my career. Now, what about the research? 50 years worth of MMPI research. Now, you might ask, how could a young man like me possibly have been doing research for 50 years? Well, the answer is quite simple. If you take a really close look at my Vita, you'll find that I published my first paper when I was five years old. <laughs> um, so that accounts for that. But at any rate, in trying to figure out what I wanted to tell you about MMPI research that, that I've been involved in, um, I, I need to first, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. I need first to tell you about something else that happened at Kent that was very influential in my career. In 1990, the Department of Psychology at Kent was recruiting for a clinical faculty member uh, for the department. Uh, I had met Yossi ben Porath when he was a graduate student working with Jim Butcher and doing some of the analyses on the MMPI re-standardization project. Uh, I asked Yossi, if he would like to apply for the position, and he agreed. We had to lie a little bit to the department because they didn't want two MMPI people in such a small department. So we misrepresented a little bit what his interests were, telling them that he was interested in stress and coping, which you know, wasn't a total lie. But we downplayed the MMPI stuff uh, rather well. And Yossi was hired and came on board in 1990. Uh, shortly after uh, Yossi arrived, uh, he and I started uh, research collaboration, established a personality assessment lab at Kent State, which really continues to this date. We have uh, had quite a number of students, uh, postdocs uh, come through the program, and some of those I see in the audience today, and they, of course, have moved on to their own careers in uh, personality assessment. So what do I want to share with you about the actual uh, research that we have been involved with uh, over the years? We've done a lot of things, a, a, quite a variety of things, in fact. We've done studies on the characteristics of pathological gamblers. We've uh, studied uh, uh, therapeutic assessment using the MMPI 2RF. We've studied marital counseling using the MMPI. So we've done a lot of things. But as I looked over the yellowed copies of reprints, and some of you young people probably don't know that we used to actually buy paper copies of our articles and keep them, and people would request them, and we'd send them out in the mail. Now, of course, you just you have immediate access to these uh, via the internet. Uh, but at any rate, as I looked through, uh, the, the reprints of our studies and thought about what we had done, I decided that I would try to focus on three questions that seemed to persist through the years and guided to a large extent uh, what we uh, would be researching. Uh, the first of these uh, is, are there reliable and meaningful correlates of MMPI to scales and configurations that apply across settings. The second are the MMPI two scales useful with persons whose backgrounds and cultural experiences are different from those used in the development of MMPI scales uh, and the norming of the test. And then finally, how effectively can the MMPI instruments detect persons who take the test with the intention of presenting an unrealistically favorable impression of themselves. So I'm going to focus in the time that I have on these three questions and share with you a little bit about we, what we and others have done to try to answer those questions. And so this is the first question. Are there reliable and meaningful correlates of MMPI two scales and configurations 
that apply across settings. Uh, we need to back up a little bit and give you a little bit of history that uh, led us to uh, investigate this research question. Uh, Hathaway and Mill uh, developed an atlas that probably was Hathaway and uh, McKinley. Then it would fall, you know? Doesn't matter. Uh, developed an atlas for clinical use of the MMPI, and then later Hathaway and Monacasey developed an atlas for use with adolescents uh, for MMPI interpretation. These were not really empirical uh, works as such, but what they were were compendia of clinical information about uh, patients or clients or adolescents who produced a particular uh, configuration of scores on the MMPI scales. Uh, so uh, th there would be a number of cases reported. They would uh, extract the salient characteristics of people who produced those configurations. And it was really seen as providing clinicians who would use the MMPI with a, 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 d a database where they could be reminded of what other patients and, and clients were like who produce a particular configuration that their uh, current client or patient uh, had produced. In 1954, I'm sure you're all aware of Paul Meal's book, Clinical Versus Statistical Prediction. Uh, it was Meal's contention that using formulas and classification tables and, and other actuarial and uh, empirical data, one could interpret psychological tests, particularly the MMPI, better than a clinician could do simply by looking at the profile and coming up with some inferences or predictions. Uh, Mill followed that uh, book with a, an American psychologist paper in 1954 where he made a plea for a good cookbook for psychological test interpretation. Uh, the, his plea was answered by a number of people, and I've listed just a few of the code books here that were a result of Beale's uh, suggestion. Oops, sorry. We have Drake and Edding, uh, going the wrong way. Uh, Good and Brantner, Marx and Seaman, Gilberstadt and Duker. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these works. Some of you may be, some may not. But the idea here is they presented uh, classification data that would allow you to de determine uh, what uh, kind of MMPI protocol a particular uh, client or patient or even non-client or non-patient produced. And then you would look up in, the, in their books and you would find the scores, configurations of scores of your client, and then they would present you a good bit of uh, information. Uh, much like was presented this morning from my book on the 2332. Uh, those were alleged to be strictly empirical uh, correlates for configurations, but in reality, uh, they weren't. There were some data generated, but as we look very closely later, Yossi and I, at the code books, particularly the Marx and Seaman, it was very clear that they did some cherry picking from their data. Uh, they pulled out things that were consistent, I think, with their preconceived notions about what people should be like, and they totally ignored other data from their own research that would have added correlates that they didn't think belonged there. So for example, for those of you who are MMPI literate, uh, they had a 4994 kind of uh, profile. And as you might expect, they listed uh, characteristics like antisocial, uh, substance abuse problems, impulsive, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but what they didn't do is include in that description things like depression and anxiety, which when you look at their actual data were very strong correlates for that code type. But again, it wasn't exactly, uh, it, well, it wasn't at all uh, empirical in the sense that uh, they didn't present all of the data. Clinicians, however, were very excited about these code books because it made life easy. Uh, you look up your profile and you jot down the descriptors for that profile type and you were done with the MMPI interpretation. 
Uh, enthusiasm waned, however, when it became obvious that a very small percentage of clients or patients in a given setting could meet the criteria for inclusion in one of their types. They had a number of rules. It wasn't just the two highest scales. Sometimes they've had as many as 10 rules that had to be met before a protocol could be placed into one of these categories. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of protocols encountered in clinical settings could be classified, and then the rest, uh, you simply couldn't use these code books. So there then began a uh, sort of a resurgence of interest in looking at behavioral correlates of the individual scales and trying to build some construct validity for each of the scales by doing research that would inform us about what people are like who uh, produced a level of score on a particular scale or who had a configuration of MMPI scales. And, and that's really uh, what led us into our uh, research on correlates, and particularly the notion of if they applied across settings. You know, if uh, people uh, with high scale two scores were depressed in a mental health center, were they also depressed in an inpatient setting or a correctional setting and what have you? And I think it was uh, this work, as well as the empirical tradition, that was passed down from Hathaway uh, to Dahlstrom to me and then to my students uh, that led to our emphasis on this particular research. Uh, along with uh, Yossi Ben Porath, uh, we were able to collect four uh, significantly large uh, data sets that included uh, MMPI2 data as well as external criteria generally provided by a therapist or some other uh, mental health professional who knew the particular individuals very well. So you can see some of these are really uh, quite large. Uh, we had over a thousand uh, protocols from the uh, Portage Path Community Mental Health Center. Uh, we had uh, uh, 600 from the Atlanta private practice. Uh, these were uh, psychologists in the Atlanta area who provided us with MMPI2 data on their therapy clients and then also provided us descriptions of those therapy clients. And in all of these data collections, the, the persons providing the external criterion data that we would compare with MMPI2 scores never had access to the MMPI data for the client. So they were blind to the test results. Uh, we've used these data for a, a lot of studies, even though we initially thought of it as an empirical, empirical correlates uh, approach. Uh, the, the, these data have been used by a lot of people at a lot of places. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it really points out how difficult it is to get good clinical data sets, particularly sets where you have something, some information about the test taker that is independent of the test scores. Uh, but we did follow through with our notion of looking for correlates across settings. And this, I won't take you through all of this, but these are the uh, strongest relationships with external criteria for each of the uh, clinical scales. And I don't know if you can really see this very well, but I'll help you here. So for example, for scale one, the uh, hypochondriasis scale, across all four settings, you really see that, the prior, that somatization, health concerns, health problems uh, really uh, were present across all four of the settings. If you look at scale two, the depression scale, you see that uh, some form of depression is present across all of the settings. Depressed, depressed, depression, lacks energy, sad, and blue. Scale three, of course, overlaps very significantly with uh, scale one, so the correlates there are virtually the same. We get a little bit uh, less uh, consistency if we look at scale four, 
Uh, this, I, I have never understood why inpatients high on scale four were rated as not being grandiose. I'll, I'll tell you what I think in a minute. Uh, also, we got depression and psychoticism in the outpatient sample. Private practice, we, we, we did see depression. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, antisocial and with the normative sample getting in trouble with the law. Uh, I won't go through all the rest of these, but you get the point here is that for, for each of the clinical scales, the external correlates of those scales were very consistent across these very different kinds of, of settings, which lends us uh, some confidence when we see a particular elevation uh, that the characteristics we're going to attribute uh, to that elevation uh, are, are probably going to hold regardless of the setting in which the test is taken. Now, if we can back up for just a moment, you'll see, I'd like to, you to see something else in this table. Look at scale one, we had, sorry, we had somatization across the board, but look at, we have hallucinations in the inpatient, we have depression and anxiety in the outpatient. We have anxiety and depression in private practice uh, and pretty much in the normative sample. And I really need to back up and tell you a little bit about this normative sample. As part of the development of the MMPI-2, we collected normative data from across the country. And for a significant number, actually 822 individuals also had their spouse come and participate in the data collection. And we had the partners, the usually spouses, but the partners uh, rate each other on a number of symptoms, problems, behavioral characteristics without knowing what the other one was doing. It's kind of interesting, I was involved in some of the data sites and the partners were very much interested in what their, their partner was saying about them. What is he gonna say about me? So we. Sorry, we put them in different corners of the room so they absolutely couldn't be influenced by the other person. Uh, so what we're seeing here, if we keep going, is that you're seeing anxiety and depression uh, pretty much across the board on all of these clinical scales. And so what, what, what we're really seeing in these data is, first of all, that the clinical scales seem to have very good convergent validity across settings. You know, people high on scale one are really uh, somatically uh, preoccupied and, and, and so forth. And that's evidence of convergent validity. That is, we're getting correlations between the scales and the external behaviors that are conceptually relevant to the scales. But what we're also seeing here is the absence of very good discriminant validity. We're seeing correlations between the scales and the external behaviors that really aren't all that conceptually relevant to the, uh, to the clinical scale. Uh, and therefore, uh, the discriminant validity was really not very good. Now, uh, Telegon, uh, Aka Telegon, realized quite some time ago that this was a problem. And he described uh, demoralization as something that was really present in virtually all of the MMPI scales. And he talked about demoralization as a broad, affectively colored dimension, for example, distress, unhappiness, depression, anxiety, that was represented to some degree in each of the clinical scales. So we, we were not getting a very clear, crisp picture based on the clinical scales. We got what we, we would hope to get, but we got a lot of stuff that essentially was garbage in terms of uh, the, the correlates. So uh, Aka's work, uh, along with Yossi and, and some others, resulted in a set of uh, MMPI scales called the restructured clinical scales, or the RC scales. Uh, each of these clinical scales was uh, thought and to capture what was unique to that scale. So somatization for one, and depression for two, and antisocial for four, and so forth. Uh, but also, these scales uh, had been 
rid of that general demoralization factor. Now, in fact, uh, if you look at all the data, demoralization isn't completely gone from all of the scales, but it's very significantly reduced compared with what we just saw uh, for the regular clinical scales. And again, I won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, these are the correlates uh, for the RC scales across two settings, the inpatient and outpatient. We, don't, we didn't do the data analysis at this point for uh, the other two, the normal couples uh, and the private uh, practice therapy cases. And once again, what you see, what you see here is that the uh, correlates that you would expect and hope to see based on how the scales were uh, developed really do appear. You get uh, uh, somatic stuff on scale one and depression on two. Uh, scale three is a little bit, uh, we have to know, because scale three is not the same as the clinical scale three. Uh, Aka and his colleagues noted that uh, the scale was very saturated with somatization type uh, items. Uh, and there was no need to measure that again since it was already being measured in scale one. So those somatic items were taken out of the scale and the items that were left were actually flipped in scoring direction from how they were scored on the MMPI so that the items, if endorsed in the score direction, are indicative of, of cynicism. And you can see the correlates here, uh, at least for the inpatient sample, are uh, what we would expect. Uh, and we can go on with scale four and six. Uh, now, again, you see there's still some demoralization in these scales in some settings. There's still depression and anxiety, for example, with scale four, which is an antisocial scale. But if I had the correlations here, and I now regret I didn't uh, report them, you would see that the correlates of those uh, non-conceptually relevant behaviors are very much reduced in the RC scales from what we found in the uh, clinical scales. So what does this all mean? I don't know how I'm doing. Okay. What does this all mean about the uh, question of are there reliable correlates across settings for the MMPI2 scales? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, there are some elements to each of the scales uh, that seem to be very consistent from one setting to another setting to another setting. And those, uh, that kind of information can be very useful as you're trying to interpret MMPI 2s in a variety of settings. Okay, the second question. Are the MMPI 2 scales useful with persons' backgrounds and cultural experiences? are different from those used in the development of the test. Early on with the original MMPI, it, it was noted that members of ethnic minority groups, in particular early on, that was pretty much limited to black-white differences. Uh, that the individuals, that the black individuals, the minority group individuals, score higher than the Caucasian or white individuals on the number of MMPI scales. Uh, there was concern expressed in the literature that this could possibly lead to over pathologizing members of the minority group because of their somewhat higher scores on the, uh, uh, on the clinical scales. Uh, okay, before we get to our data, uh, Dahlstrom, Lashar and Dahlstrom uh, published a book called MMPI Patterns of Ethnic Minorities, I think is the title, in which they summarize data for the original MMPI uh, for a number of ethnic uh, groups, uh, especially African Americans. And what they concluded was that yes, indeed, members of these minority groups tend to score a bit higher on some of the MMPI uh, clinical scales uh, but that they concluded that those differences pretty much reduce or diminish once you control for socioeconomic status. And that the differences that remain probably are not clinically meaningful and that you could interpret the MMPI scores uh, similarly.
for persons of different, different uh, ethnic uh, groups. So that was it for the MMPI uh, itself. Now I'm going to show you results from a, just, I think, two studies that we did along these same lines. You know, the problem with the early studies of test bias against minority subjects all focused on mean differences. But several individuals like uh, uh, Rosenblatt, Pritchard and Rosenblatt, uh, Timbrook and Graham, uh, pointed out that looking at mean differences is really not the way to assess possible test bias. What you really need to do is look at the validity of a scale or a set of scales for the different groups. So it may be that a group scores higher on scale four than another group, but when you look at the relationship between scores on the scale and external criterion behaviors, it may be that they're equally valid, uh, that they work the same even though one group is scoring higher than the other. You know, and that's an example of, of intercept bias. So if we look at uh, the, the results, and I need to speed up a little, I think, for this study by Tim Burke and Graham, what we did is using those couples from the normative sample, uh, we tried to predict conceptually relevant uh, behaviors from each MMPI scale. Uh, so for example, here, uh, men are on the top and women on the bottom, but if you look at the, just the, one of these data points, uh, scale two, we use depression uh, uh, as a characteristic. And remember, depression here would have been obtained from ratings of each person by their partner. And these folks had been together on average 23 years, uh, so they really did know each other uh, very well. Uh, and then what we did then was to use the MMPI scale. This is a new pointer, so I'm having trouble with it. Uh, use the MMPI scale to predict the partner description of the individual on the relevant dimension. And what's represented here uh, in these columns under Caucasian and African American uh, is the mean error involved in making the prediction. So how much error is there when you predict depression from scale two for African Americans compared with how much error is present when you predict a depression uh, for uh, uh, Caucasians? And uh, what you see here, if you just skip over here to the, the, the P column, is there was no uh, significant difference in prediction error uh, on any of the scales. So at least in this sample with the data we had, it would appear that the MMPI scales are, are equally valid for African Americans and Caucasians. In, in another study, I hope, yeah, this is a study by John McNulty, Yossi Van Porth, and Stein and myself using our community mental health center data. Uh, and what we did here was simply to uh, look at the validity of each scale in relation to an external criterion measure separately for African Americans and Caucasians. So you see, for example, the correlation between scale one and ratings of somatic problems in this mental health center, the correlation was 0.47 for Caucasians. That's a pretty hefty correlation. Remember, this is not self-report compared with self-report. This is self-report compared with external data provided by somebody other than the test taker. So these are really pretty high correlations when you take that in mind. And then in the next column here, you see the similar correlations for the uh, African Americans. And then finally, we have a, a Z test to see if those correlations differ from each other. And again, if you go to the P column, you see that uh, there were indeed no uh, significant differences in the validity of these scales for African Americans and uh, Caucasians. Now, there have been other studies done. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Arbizzi and, and Yossi, and I don't know if there are other authors, uh, did a similar study with inpatients using technology. McNulty was involved. Uh, uh, using a more sophisticated statistical analysis, but essentially came up with the, 
same conclusion. That is that the scales in that inpatient setting seem to work equally for African Americans and Caucasians. Now, we've only talked about one ethnic group, and that's largely because that's the, where most of the research has been done. But there has been research on Hispanics, on Asian Americans, and there's a very nice study on American Indians done by uh, Roger Green and, and colleagues. And again, what they showed was that there was good validity for the MMPI scales for two tribes of American Indians. Now what they lacked in that particular study is a comparison group. They knew that the scales were valid for the American uh, Indians, but they didn't know if they were more or less valid than for the uh, 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 normative sample, and they could easily have done that, I think. So what are we to conclude about our second research question? Uh, is the test useful with individuals who are different from those involved in the development of the test and in the norming of the test? And I think the answer is yes. I think the test is equally valid with a, with a caution. You know, we haven't studied uh, every uh, group that we could study. Uh, you know, does it work the same for priests versus a normative sample? Does it work the same for older adults as it does for younger adults? I mean, there are all kinds of questions you could ask about equal validity across uh, uh, groups of people. In that vein, I would point out that Kathy Long and I uh, did a study, uh, actually two studies, in which we showed that the MMPI scores were equally valid for individuals of different educational levels, comparing those with uh, high school or less with those with professional degrees work the same, and also for family income. Uh, those with lower family income are compared with those with higher family income, and the validity of the scales across those indicated very similar uh, validity. So while there's work yet to be done, uh, I think that I am fairly confident in uh, interpreting MMPI scores uh, similarly for uh, members of uh, diverse groups. Okay, and then finally, we have our third question. How effectively can the MMPI instruments detect persons who take the test with the intention of presenting an unrealistically favorable impression? I'm sure you all can think of situations where this would be uh, possible or even likely. Uh, for example, if someone's involved in a personal injury lawsuit, they might be motivated to present themselves as having more both somatic as well as psychological problems than they really have in order to get a better settlement or a better verdict in the lawsuit. Uh, individuals who have committed crimes and are claiming they should not be held responsible because of insanity might very well exaggerate uh, problems uh, uh, in order to have uh, them held not responsible. The MMPI-2 has a number of scales that are intended to uh, identify people who approach the test in this manner. I'm not going to go through all of these with you. They're in all of the, uh, the, the textbooks and so forth. Uh, but I, I do want to share with you a couple studies that we did, and I'm going to try to make this a little bit quick here. But uh, in the first validity study, once the MMPI-2 was published, Graham Watts and Tinbrook uh, did, got these results. And let me just orient you to this table. Uh, what we have in the upside-down triangle profile are the results of Kent State students who took the test with standard instructions. And of course, they look uh, reasonably normal. We then had a, another group of Kent State students take the test with instructions to try to appear to have very serious psychological and emotional problems. And the results that you see here in the open circles uh, indicate that those students actually produce very elevated scores 
on the clinical scales, especially on those in, indicative of psychosis and other serious problems, and look at the uh, F-score. It's, it's as high as you can get on the test. And if you compare that with the triangles, you see that they're very different. It would be very easy to distinguish between a student taking the test with standard instructions and a student taking the test with instructions to appear very emotionally disturbed. But that's not what we usually want to do. We want to know, we want to say, is this person similar to individuals who actually have serious psychological emotional problems? So this third group, represented with a closed circle, uh, are scores for a group of psychiatric inpatients in a reasonably long-term facility. And as you can see, thankfully, they look uh, more disturbed than the Kent State students. Uh, but uh, they're nowhere uh, as elevated as the students who took the test with uh, instruction to fake pad. I, I'm not presenting uh, classification data, which we have in our article, uh, but what those data show is that we can very effectively separate out those individuals feigning serious psychopathology from those who have serious psychopathology. Now, in another study, well, let me uh, talk about this first. As the MMPI-2 and now the MMPI-2RF are being used in forensic settings, we have to wonder to what extent the individuals taking the test have been uh, coached or informed about how to take the test, how to beat the validity scales. So in this study, uh, uh, Corrigan and Wetter uh, surveyed a, two groups of attorneys. They only differed in terms of how often they did uh, cases where it would be likely that their clients would take psychological tests, and a, a group of uh, law students. And, and these data are for a question that asks, to what extent uh, do you feel that it is your responsibility to always or usually inform your clients about the validity scales of tests they're taking. And as you see, almost half of the attorneys feel that it is their responsibility to do so, and about a third of the students feel that it was their responsibility to do so. Now, we don't know how many of these folks actually do this. This is what they say, but we don't know what they do. And we also don't know how many of them know enough about the MMPI too that they could effectively coach uh, individuals so that they would not be detected as over-reporting. But the mere fact that they feel it is their responsibility causes us to uh, have concern uh, about over-reporting uh, in uh, these kinds of settings. So this is the last study I'm going to show you. This was done by uh, Joanne Storm, one of my former students and I, uh, in which we uh, have, again, three groups. The, the uh, triangle group is, again, from our inpatient setting. Here we go. Here, 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 here. And as you can see, uh, and these were patients who took the test with standard instructions. Uh, and as you can see, they elevate on clinical scales, as in our other study, and they elevate uh, to some extent uh, on the uh, F scale. Uh, not graphed here are FP scores, uh, which uh, were also uh, uh, high in this setting and actually uh, 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 a little bit higher than the F scale for the patients. And then the other two groups, we had a group of, uh, well, you know, I, I have this uh, legend up here called uncoached malingerers and coached malingerers. I don't like that. I don't like the term malingering because you can't really infer malingering from a psychological test. You have to know more about motive and circumstances. So I would prefer the term, if I were doing this over, uh, uncoached over-reporters or coached over-reporters. Now the uncoached uh, over-reporters are, are very similar to the previous study where uh, students were asked to take the test and try to uh, appear to have serious psychological and emotional problems. 
And you can see, again, that they produced very elevated scores, much, much more elevated than the, uh, the actual psychiatric inpatients. Uh, so uh, again, we think that this would, uh, and if you look at the classification data, I think you would conclude that we're pretty effective using F and FP in discriminating between real patients and individuals who are over-reporting psychopathology. Now, the third group is the one that's different from the other studies we had done, and these are the coached malingerers, and they're represented by the uh, open circles. Okay, here, and then this group here. So what you can see, again, and what these folks uh, were told is, first of all, very similar to the other group. We'd like you to take this test and pretend that you have very serious psychological and emotional problems. But for this particular group, we did some coaching. We gave them some tips on how to take the test so people wouldn't be able to know that they weren't being truthful and didn't really have the uh, problems and symptoms. And they were very simple tips, things like uh, don't answer too many extreme items, don't answer the very bizarre items on the test. Very, very simple uh, instructions. And uh, what we found then, of course, is that the coached group produces less elevated scores, not only on the clinical scales, but also on the validity scales. But even then, you see that the coached group is significantly higher than the, the real patients. So although our classific classification data would suggest we are less able to identify the uh, coach malingerers, we can still do so at a, a pretty good uh, accuracy rate. So then what does this tell us about the question of whether the MMPI-2 can detect these individuals who are uh, purporting to have very serious psychological and emotional problems? I think what it tells us is that uh, we, we can do that pretty effectively. Uh, if people are over-reporting uh, traditional psychopathology, uh, we can pick them up pretty readily on the F and the FP scales. Uh, if they are coached, if they are told how to not be detected, it's a little bit harder to do, but we still do it with pretty good accuracy. Now, both of these studies use students who were told to over-report pathology. And that may not be the most ecological uh, group to use uh, for this purpose. Arbizi and others, and I apologize, I don't know all the others. I know Ben Porth was in that, that group. And McNulty again, Three Stooges maybe. Uh, did did the, a very similar study to this with uh, psychiatric inpatients who were asked to over-report uh, their own psychopathology, and then compared them with the patients who took the test with standard instructions, and they really got results very, very similar to us, with FP really working the best in, in that particular setting. So I'm pretty confident uh, that uh, the test can provide information about over-reporting. Whether that qualifies as malingering, I don't know. Uh, others have developed uh, scales that are not routinely scored in the MMPI-2, but are in the MMPI-2-RF. Uh, for example, Dustin Wigant and, and Yossi ben Porath developed a, an FS scale, a, a uh, uh, infrequency uh, somatic scale. And that's not the exact name, I apologize, guys. But uh, it, it was a scale designed to detect people who were in personal injury situations. And, and we're likely to be over-reporting somatic and, and even neuropsychological problems. And that scale seems to be working pretty well as well. And then Roger Gervais and others uh, developed a response bias scale, and, and that was developed specifically in, for situations where people might be over-reporting neuropsych kinds of problems. And that scale has shown some very promising results. So I'm pretty confident uh, that, that we can pick up people who aren't doing what we really told them to do, which is take the test honestly. So where does this leave us? Uh, where is the journey? I've already told you that I'm retiring officially in a few months, 
I don't know that that's the end of my journey, but I think the pace will certainly slow. We have a lot of data at Kent that we've collected that we've never analyzed and published. I'm hoping that former students like Taylor Lee, uh, Leslie, uh, Hibbing and, and others, well, Ajay, who were involved in that data collection will carry on and do some of the uh, same kinds of studies there. Uh, if we look here, these are the folks, I think, who will continue the assessment journey. I don't know how well you can recognize people here, but these are photographs uh, that were taken of uh, Yossi and, and me and our former postdocs and students at various uh, MMPI meetings. So these are the folks, I think, who have the responsibility uh, along with uh, people like Paul Arbizzi and I think McNulty is in this picture. Arbizzi isn't because he wasn't a Kent person, but uh, he certainly will be carrying on uh, as well. And just in conclusion then, well, who knows where their journeys will take them. My journey has been long, uh, it's been exciting, it's been interesting, uh, and I certainly wish the same for others who are gonna carry on from here. Thank you very much.